this congressional candidate forum. Uh, thank you to uh, Jennifer Carnahan for uh, hosting this. My name is Drew. I'm with uh, Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, co-host of the Justice and Drew program. You can hear it every morning from 6 to 9. And again, thanks to the GOP and uh, Jennifer for inviting, uh, inviting me out. It's an honor to be a part of this uh, congressional candidate panel. I figure we'll start off by giving everybody a chance. You got one minute. Give us your one minute stump, who you are, why you're running, and what your, what your uh, top issue is. All right, hi, I'm Jim Hagedorn from the first district down here in southern Minnesota. It's the I-90 district, all the way from Wisconsin to South Dakota, Iowa, up about 80 miles. You might remember, I'm the guy that almost beat Tim Walls in the last race. We had 49.6% of the vote. We kept working. Walls is out doing something else. I'm not sure what that is, but you know, God bless him in his endeavors. But uh, the reason I'm running for Congress is because I want to be a conservative reinforcement in the Republican House of Representatives to partner with our president to make our country great again in some key areas, to make sure that we have a country that's safe, prosperous, and that we protect our God-given rights. And I think the, the president and our Republican Party needs people like the, the, those of us on the stage. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pete Stauber, and I'm running as a, in CD8, which is northern Minnesota. And Jim, I, I hate to say this, but it's God's country up there. <laughs> it goes from Grand Marais to Wadena, uh, up near International Falls, right down to uh, Chisago County. Uh, it's the uh, biggest house district in the nation, with the exception of uh, Alaska 1. And uh, again, my name is Pete Stauber. I'm married with four children. Uh, they're 17, 16, 15. I recently retired. Uh, from the Duluth Police Department as a Lieutenant Commander after uh, 23 years. Thank you very much. I'm very proud of our service and Duluth's a great department. Uh, you know what I'm running? Uh, because I think there's absolutely uh, a change that's needed in Washington. And we as in rural Minnesota, Main Street, Minnesota, as I say, we are seeing Washington being dysfunctional. And what we have to do is we have to get uh, together and do what's right for all Americans, regardless of political uh, party, we have to move the needle to the right, and that's my goal. The uh, we have mining and manufacturing up in the uh, Great Northland we call the Iron Range, and you know that the Obama administration put a, a halt to uh, mineral exploration, not mining precious metals, mineral exploration. To me, that's unconscionable, and those are some things that w are happening in CD8 that I am going to fight for the American worker and good paying jobs uh, on the Iron Range and in the Duluth or Hermantown area. Thanks, Pete. My name is Dave Hughes. I was the 2016 Republican Party candidate for House of Representatives in Minnesota 7. I la ran last year and came within five points of beating then 26-year incumbent Colin Peterson. That was the best result in 22 years, and I got more votes than any candidate ever against Colin. I am a constitutional conservative Republican, and I'm running for office because I think our country has been heading in the wrong direction for at least 80 years. Uh, Tom Member the other day said it was longer, all the way back to President Wilson. I am a constitutionalist and an originalist, and I stand for the values of our founding and the enduring principles that made this country great. I want to go to Washington because, uh, as many have said, business as usual isn't going to cut it anymore. And I don't want to go to Washington and continue the status quo. I want to work with President Trump, as Jim said, and I want to work with the House Freedom Caucus to implement a very conservative program. I am for making the government much, much smaller than it presently is so that we can lower taxes much lower than they presently are. And that's what I stand for. My district is largely agricultural, and what I want everybody here to know is that I don't have any intention at all of doing anything other than blessing the farmers of western Minnesota. My program is to go to Washington and do even better than they think Colin Peterson has done for them. So my name's Dave Hughes. I live up in the northwest part of the district in Kitson uh, County in the town of Carlstad. I'm a 22-year Air Force retired uh, combat veteran, and I'm married with seven children. I'm very happy to be here today, so thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having us here. My name is Tim Miller and I'm running for Congressional District 7 alongside Dave. And a little bit about me, um, I uh, grew up in a working class home in a, in a spacious home of about 900 square feet. I've worked my whole life uh, to earn what I've, what I've accomplished. I put myself through college. I'm, I'm a veteran. I, I am an independent business person. I'm married with seven children and four grandchildren. And the reason why that I'm going to uh, Washington is I look at Western Minnesota and over the last 28 years that's really been Colin Peterson's legacy and what have we seen over the last 28 years 
less people living out there, less jobs. We have our children that are moving out. We have regulations that are absolutely killing our farmers and killing our businesses. And we can do better. I'm going to be the fresh voice for CD7. I believe that that's what's needed. Colin Peterson has been there long enough. And when I go there, I'm going to focus on the, on the things that require us to build those businesses, excuse me, those businesses, and get those uh, people to move back to greater Minnesota. When I ran, I'm a state representative, and when I ran and was elected in 2014, I was the first person elected to my, a Republican in my district in over 30 years. I'm going to bring that experience to this campaign, and I firmly believe that I'm going to be able to win this district for Republicans and conservatism. Thank you. I'm Matt Brosh, and I'm running for CD7. I was uh, born in Pipestone, grew up and lived all my life in Lake Benton, uh, dairy farmer and grain farmer. Uh, I joined the military in my senior year and um, I went to college and um, uh, my wife my, my wife and I have celebrated 10 years together last week and we got three beautiful kids and I've been running my trucking company for the last 12 years since I was 22 and I'm running because we need to keep our conservative values in Washington. Um, Colin Peterson needs to go. We have absolutely no representation with him. He, consi he considers himself a blue dog Democrat, and you can't do that when you vote for Bernie Sanders. So, thank you. All right, they told me I could uh, I could talk about any topics I wanted. I could select any of the questions. So I want to start with really the biggest, most important issue. How about that Game of Thrones finale last night, huh? That was, no? No, oh, all right. Uh, your opponents are, let's start with the, the big elephant in the room, right, President Trump. Your opponents are likely going to be running more against Trump than they are you. Um, you're going to find yourself over the course of the campaign inevitably either defending or distancing yourself from something Trump said or did. Probably going to be doing both over the course of your campaign. Talk about the the broad Trump effect, the, the Trump phenomenon. Do you expect it to be more of a hindrance or a help? Uh, to your campaigns. We'll start with you, since you're holding the, the mic. I have the microphone, so I guess I'll go first. So Tim Miller, CD7. And he, President Trump is the big elephant in the room, and I'm thankful for that. I fully support President Trump. I think he is mixing things up in Washington, and he's causing them to ask the questions that need to be asked, and he's calling on people to do the things that people are asking them to do. I can tell you that in Congressional District 7, despite all of the bad media against him, despite all of the attacks on him, the support for him is greater than ever. And I think we need to rally behind our president and to be able to get the things done that he is asking us to do. The biggest thing, when people ask me, what's the most important thing that you've seen in the Minnesota State House, or what's required in Congress, in the United States Congress, is one word, and that's courage. We need to have courage to do the things that we know that are right. The right things are not complicated, but they take courage. And so I intend to go to Congress, show that courage, and help President Trump with whatever we need to get accomplished. I'm Pete Stauber, running for CD8, and uh, President Trump is, uh, is going to help our district. He ran on support of mining. He ran on the support of military, and I am a military family. My wife spent 23 years as a, a military uh, person. She is an Iraq war veteran, the first female command chief of the 148th Fighter Wing. I am a military supporter. <laughs> President Trump also uh, supports uh, law enforcement. I recently retired after 23 years of professional service, and I can tell you this, that the last eight years under the uh, former president was devastating to the culture of law enforcement. And so when President Trump was elected, the vast majority of us took a deep breath, a sigh of relief, because we know that we have a president that has our back, that understands that it's difficult. Of the thousands of calls that we go on every day, the men and women go on every day, somebody would pick out one call, and put it on the news and paint us all as, as whatever happened on that call. Uh, President Trump is, 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 uh, is uh, fighting, uh, I think, for the right uh, things at the right time. And uh, I've asked him publicly, I, I've asked him and Secretary Zinke to come up to northern Minnesota and reverse that mining ban. We want him up there, and I know that the White House has heard our, uh, heard our call. So uh, I welcome President Trump and members of his, his administration, Governor Pence, to come up to northeastern Minnesota and, and uh, help uh, campaign with me. 
And uh, one of the greatest things that I had to do, uh, Drew, was uh, last year, I was uh, before the election, I was able to introduce uh, then Governor Pence during a rally at the uh, Duluth International Airport hangar, and you could have, you could have, the enthusiasm was unbelievable. And uh, our district went uh, for Trump by 16 percent. I have no reason to believe it won't. Uh, support a conservative in uh, uh, next uh, year's election, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, all I can tell you is when you crisscross southern Minnesota, as we do, we're walking 50 parades, going to all the fairs and everything. The people that supported President Trump in this last election, and he carried our district very, very soundly, they're not upset with Donald Trump. They're, not, they're upset with Republicans in Washington for not doing a better job of helping our president get the agenda through particularly the senators and when you look at the district you know let's let's just be honest about the last election had we lost that presidential election we would have lost the country we would have lost the Supreme Court for our lifetimes and they would have invalidated everything we wanted to do from that point forward but we're in this position now with this opportunity and we have to make our country we have to move it in this new direction with these reforms that the president's talking about in the areas of securing our country protecting it making sure that we reform our economy with regulatory reform, tax reform, these things to grow jobs and to protect our, protect our God-given rights. So I'm supportive of those policies. We ran with them in the last election. And the clear contrast is this. The Democrats are running around resisting and trying to replace our president. We're trying to move our country in a new direction. I think the voters will reward us for it in the next one. Dave Hughes running for Congress in uh, Minnesota's 7th Congressional District. Uh, I support President Trump and uh, like, uh, like Tim and uh, Jim just said, uh, I haven't seen any negative in uh, CD7. Tr President Trump carried our district by 30 percent and uh, so there's a lot of goodwill there and I, I haven't seen any change in that, nor do I feel that way. I, I fully support President Trump's uh, program. Uh, there's a, a few things that have been highlighted recently that I just want to note. Uh, Congressman Emmer spoke recently about the fact that uh, um, Congress has passed 14 uh, Congressional Review Act uh, bills and sent it to President Trump for his signature and he signed them into law. And that's gone a long way towards uh, trimming back the state and making government smaller, which is what I support. He's also been great on the travel ban. Despite all the, the, the media attention and all the hoopla about that, I think he was right on. His first effort was completely legally sound. And so all that unnecessary revision and stuff uh, was a, a waste of energy, unfortunately. So I supported that all the way. And I think that his program is, is a good thing. And so uh, I'm going to continue to back him because I, I think that his program uh, is conservative and the, and the way to go for the country. Matt Prosh, CD7. Yes, I too am 100% behind on President Donald Trump. He's created a million new jobs. He's got us out of that egregious Paris Treaty Agreement. Um, it's, yeah, it's not Donald Trump's, it's the Senate. The Senate has to get behind him. And then yeah, we'll be off and running. Let's focus uh, specifically on CD7 for just a moment. You mentioned that Trump carried your district by 30 uh, percent. Your area, and, and even CD8 as well, uh, is kind of known for being relatively conservative, uh, sending a lot of Republicans to a lot of elected offices, yet they continue to send Colin Peterson, they continue to send Rick Nolan back to Congress. Can you speak a bit about why you think uh, though Nolan and Peterson have had such, such success in what should be you know, conservative Republican districts and what you're going to do to sort of re reverse that trend. Yes, I, well, I, I think Colin Peterson has got the, you know, the sugar beet farmers and the dairy farmers behind him and the certain farmers he got, got behind him, but I want to go there and, and uh, do a better job than what he's done and get more people behind me and, and get the, yeah, and, and do more for, for the farmers because at the end of the day, he answers Nancy Pelosi's, and so he can't get his farming agenda passed. So I want to be an encouragement to everyone in that I firmly believe that Colin Peterson's uh, foundation that we talk about is quickly eroding. The farmers that we're talking about that supposedly support him are actually switching with that because with agriculture, he's farm bill, farm bill, farm bill, when actually trade is a very large issue particularly for protein, animal agriculture, and he's very weak on that. And I point that out because what needs to happen in CD7 to be successful against someone that's been a longtime incumbent is, is you have to be able to put in the work to get out your message and press him against the issues. He has not been perfect on all the issues. He's skirted by over the years because there has not been, there has not been a campaign 
that has been able to overcome why well, I do the farm bill, therefore all the farmers like me, and then we go from there. It's a very large district, folks. For those of you here that don't understand, it's Canada down to Pipestone. 38 counties, there's a great deal to do there. And the reason why I think I'm going to be successful with that is because in the past I've built, my house district is a very large district for the house. And we built a successful team around that. We are building a successful team throughout the entire district right now that's going to penetrate down to the, to the town level, to the precinct level. And we are going to force Colin Peterson to come out and address some of the issues that he has not been doing up until this point. And I believe that his support is going to fail. Folks, it's in our plus 12 district. We just have to get our peoples to vote for us, and we win. The question is, uh, why does Colin keep winning? Uh, you know, he's, he's in his 27th year, and, and the reason he keeps winning is because he portrays himself as a blue dog Democrat, as a moderate. And the media helps him out a lot. The media is always lauding him for the 33% of the time that he votes against his party. The question that we all need to answer, and the one I want you guys to be aware of, is that no journalist, no academician anywhere can ever point to a single time that he, he's voted against his party where it ever amounted to anything. Name, name the big bill that the Democrats wanted to pass that failed because Colin Peterson didn't support it. Name the big bill that the Republicans wanted to pass that did pass because of his one vote. I, I don't think you'll find it. I haven't been able to find it. I haven't had anybody who told me that, that uh, he's done that. So it's kind of a, a, a fiction that he's this uh, maverick in his own party. What he does is he votes against his own party to suit his needs to get reelected. That's it. Uh, the two big issues that everybody always points out is that his voting record on the Second Amendment is pretty good and his voting record on abortion is good. The problem is, is he never champions either of those causes, and especially not abortion. I want to go to Washington in my first week in office, submit a constitutional amendment to prohibit abortion in the United States of America. And you won't see Colin Peterson ever talk about that, much less do anything. Thank you very much, uh, Pete Stauber, CD8. And so I look at my opponent, and uh, in, in many aspects, he's out of touch. We just talked about, uh, uh, he just mentioned abortion. I support life from conception to natural death. Uh, my, I will not waver on that. I also, support our, I also support our Second Amendment. I've been a police officer. I have been a victim of a violent crime in 1995. In December of 95, I was shot in the head by a criminal who had an extensive criminal history, and by the grace of God, I'm still here. Three years later, I had a guy pull a gun on me in a hostage situation while I was at work. He pulled the trigger, and by the grace of God, it malfunctioned. I still am a Second Amendment supporter. And you know what? My wife and I are concealed carry uh, holders, and that life-saving device, I call it my life-saving device that I carry with me, and my opponent would much rather have us not have that ability. I will fight for the Second Amendment. I, I, I can also say this. We talk about uh, CD7's got a lot of farmers. I can tell... I can tell you in CD8, on the western part of CD8, we have farmers, and my opponent voted to support uh, the waters of the United States, meaning that your farmers, the ponds, the ditches, uh, will now come under federal regu regulation. Are you kidding me? And uh, one of the things that, that uh, I'm going to stand up and do is, is when I support my party, I support it fully. When I disagree, I will tell you why. And one of the things that we have to look at as, a, as an entire party is I, t I said earlier, let's move that needle to the right just gently. As uh, uh, Speaker Gazelka said, let's move it gently. It's going to take continued pressure to do that. And I look at uh, what my opponent has done, what he has failed to do, and I've had it. I want to raise uh, my family. I want to give my this country, this greatest country, uh, in the hands of our kids and tell them, this is yours. You better be ready for it. The greatest generation gave me or gave us this country we have to move it forward with the conservative values and I can tell you what my opponent uh, does not believe in, in co the conservative values in fact he said this just last week he said this single-payer health care is fundamentally American single-payer I couldn't disagree with that more I could not disagree with that more and we'll we, we, during this debate or during this campaign you will see a stark contrast between myself and Rick Nolan. Since uh, you, Jim, are running in CD1, uh, you've run against uh, Walls a few, uh, the, this is your third time, time, right? Two times. Talk a little bit about how running for an open seat and not against an incumbent sort of changes that dynamic and what benef how that might benefit your campaign. 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a huge benefit. I mean, the uh, incumbency is a big deal. Last year in the House, I think there were 170 Democrats that ran for re-election. Only one of them lost, and that was a fellow down in Nebraska in a Republican district. And after that, uh, in the eighth district and in our district, we ran the two closest races in the country. So with walls out and his incumbency advantage gone for the Democrats, he outspent me four to one. He had better name ID, had connections across the district. In some ways, that flips to us because we've been working the district for now four years, and we continue to work the district. I used to work for Congressman Arlen Stanglin up in the seventh district many years ago, and he was a great guy. I enjoyed I enjoyed working for Arlen. Uh, but I happened to be there for four straight elections when Colin Peterson ran against us, and he finally wore us down. And that was probably, at a young age, I realized that perseverance in a big district like the one I'm trying to represent, 21 counties, sometimes that's what it takes. Things are different this time. With the walls out, we've already raised over $350,000, which is more money than we spent last time. Uh, we have some support coming in from Washington. And I think just the idea that there are seven Democrats running around trying to get known trying to raise money, and we happen to have been the one that they've seen on the ballot a couple of times. I think with that experience, we're, we're in a good position, but we take nothing for granted. We work very hard, and we'll continue to do all that through next year. Uh, Trump came very close to winning Minnesota, closer than anybody has in a long time. I think he only lost like in, in nine counties. Do you think, and this will be for the round table, just uh, quick answers, do you think that was do you think that momentum will carry over into the midterm elections, or do you feel like uh, there might be some uh, some pulling back now that he's actually won and is in office? We'll start with you. I, I think it's going to carry over because we have the right message. We have the right president at the right time uh, with the right message. And the candidates that are, that are up here, I believe, are the, are the right candidates with that right message at the right time. I think people uh, want a limited government. They, the, the intrusion, the tentacles in all aspects of our lives, we want to become, we want to have more personal freedom, more economic freedom, and support those constitutional rights that our founding fathers gave us. And I think President Trump's, that momentum is going to grow because uh, what, we, what we're seeing in Washington is the president being attacked by uh, many sides, and he's still standing, and we still have a lot of support for him. And uh, I think it's going to help, without question. I think uh, his program is sound, and so I'm confident that it'll help us in our in our election efforts next year. Uh, but the, the key to that is the senior leadership of the Congress. If uh, if the Senate and the House senior leadership will cooperate and and back what President Trump is trying to accomplish, I think uh, I think it can do nothing but help. Uh, and so I, I want to see more of that. Um, they're doing some good things, but I, I think the key is to Congress to um, to back President Trump. I just want to get mad. I'm always going right in front of them. So uh, the people of CD7 are looking for someone to say what they do, do what they say, show boldness, show courage, show the things that the American people are just demanding for someone to do. And that's President Trump. So I have every confidence that he's going to continue to do well in our district. I have no reason to think that anything other. I can tell you when I was out in a, a couple county fairs over the last couple weeks, we had people coming by, and this is in one of my counties that's a rather Democrat district. They're coming to the Republican booth asking for Trump bumper stickers because they want to stand up for him. They want to defend him. I firmly believe that as he moves forward and gets these things accomplished that he says he's going to do, it's going to improve our, our uh, chances in the district, and I see absolutely no backlash in CD7. Yes, I totally agree. It is only going to help, and, and once we repeal and replace Obamacare and lower taxes, we will just launch off of that and he'll get reelected and then Mike Pence will get reelected and or get elected in twenty four. So I like your confidence. I, I just think uh, if you look at the special elections that we had across the country that were very contested, I think the one in Georgia they spent forty million to try to beat our candidate. And you look at and the Democrats say, Oh yeah, but the Republicans barely won those. But we won those. What it tells me is that in districts that the president carried, the voters still want the president and his agenda to get through. They still support the president. They support what we're trying to do. But this is about policies, and it's about the difference between the left and the right. And we have to articulate the differences. The left wants open borders. The left wants a flood of refugees from countries that hate America. The left has degraded our military over these last eight years and put us in a tough spot. We're on the other side. We want secure borders. We want to build the wall. We want to make sure that our country's protected from Islamic supremacists, that we have peace through strength. 
and we make when we make that difference the voters are going to respond and they're going to vote for us let's talk a little bit about health care we've all seen the efforts to repeal obamacare to repeal the affordable care act to replace it uh talk a little bit about the impact the affordable care act has had that you've seen in your districts and are you more of a repeal guy, a replace guy, a little bit of both? Where do you stand in the federal government's role in our health care? Obamacare has been a disaster in southern Minnesota. It's driven up premiums with deductibles so high that most of the people, their insurance is virtually worthless. It's degraded opportunity, obviously limited choice. It's not good for our medical care system. It needs to be repealed. And I believe it does need to re be replaced with free market reforms. And what that means for me is transparency and cost. It means people being allowed to use pre-tax dollars for their medical care, for their insurance, to fund their accounts. It means things like competition across state lines with catastrophic coverage. Back and people uh, would have also uh, pre-existing conditions. We'd have a pool for them so they would be covered. So if we do those types of things, you can put downward pressure on cost and we can have a good medical care system going into the future. But it's been a disaster. It was the biggest issue in agriculture in the last election. Farmers are, are struggling here with high input costs, low commodity prices, and paying twenty five and $30,000 a year for premiums for insurance that was worthless, which is killing farmers. Jim didn't leave anything for me to say. He said it all. I, t I tell you what, uh, we know that Obamacare has been a disaster. Our, our governor even said that it's unaffordable. We can't afford it anymore. I talked to a small business owner who's got who's married with two young children. His premiums went up twenty four hundred dollars for this year. It's unconscionable. And let me tell you something else. Abortion is not health care. It should never be funded by the federal government. Never. And one of the things that I want to make sure what, what I favor repealing and given us time getting uh, the, the, the minds, the powers to be, the doctors, the actuaries, to get in there and, and, and really give us the true cost of, of health care. And I can tell you something uh, from a military family. It was about three years ago when the 44th president of this country tried to take TRICARE, which is the military assurance away, insurance away, right? So my family's under TRICARE, my wife and my children. What I saw was a bipartisan effort. Democrats and Republicans came together and said, uh-uh, to the 44th president. The men and women earned that uh, privilege to have health care, and, and doggone it, we're going to keep it uh, for them. So when I'm in Congress, I'm going to repeal and give us time to replace it so, so we have that 12 to 16 month period to get it right. It's been a disaster. Nobody can, nobody can point to one single legislation that only one political party endorsed that uh, cost 20% of our economy. And that, the, the Democrats threw that on the American people and, and uh, tried to destroy us. We're fighting back. We have the opportunity right now. Getting the right people we, uh, in, into Congress and, and Senate and the White House to work together to, to repeal in a timely manner is uh, what I support. But I do not support single payer. I do not support single payer. Yes, I, I would like to repeal and replace Obamacare. It's a socialistic program. It has no business being here. And, yes. The ACA has been devastating to rural Minnesota. I can tell you last fall, the individual market collapsed, which the individual, thank you, the individual market collapsed in rural Minnesota, which is about 80% of the people that are covered out there. And I heard it directly from my constituents. I had one woman who called me and she said, my husband has throat cancer. He just had surgery, and he's on chemotherapy, and the way that I understand it, he loses his coverage, and he's no longer going to be able to go to the Mayo Clinic and get that care for him. And the best that I could tell, him, tell her was that's absolutely accurate. We did not have a choice. She was told she was going to have to take him to the University of Iowa to do this treatment. They were going to have to pay it, $30,000 a month. I worked very hard on this over the last year, and I'm going to continue to work hard on this. We did some good things in Minnesota. We have a lot more to go. I passed, my bill was passed into law, believe it or not, signed by Governor Dayton, which is a pretty rare thing for a Republican. I had the Agricultural Cooperative Health Plan. 
that you're going to see transform. There's already, they're already going to be beginning this phone. It's going to give people what we promised them originally, lower costs, access to their doctors, and the care that they need. I'm going to take that on to the United States Congress. I believe that we absolutely need to repeal the ACA. However, we also have to follow that up with solutions, true free market solutions. A lot of people say, let's get back to what we were before. That's not at all the case. That wasn't free market either. The, the answers to how we fix this are not complicated. Competition over the borders, over the borders of the states. Um, allowing, allowing people to have uh, competition across different markets. We can do these different things if we, have the, if we have the people willing to have the courage to get this stuff done. Special interests have dug their claws deep into this, and this is across party lines, I'm sorry to say, but we are going to have to get the things done that people are asking us to do. That's what people are looking for in their congressmen. It amazes me. We have 10 per, what 10 percent favorability of Congress right now, maybe 11 percent, and yet we still continue to do the same old, same old. Why are we doing that? I prefer to stand with the other 90 percent. I'm Dave Hughes, running in uh, District 7 for Congress. I agree with what everybody said up here. Uh, you asked, uh, is it repeal and replace or just repeal? I'm for a complete uh, repeal, a clean repeal, and no replacement with any kind of uh, federal government centered. The problem is the senior leadership of both the House and the Senate, they think they need to replace that 2,700 page uh, ACA with another big government program. And I oppose that. Uh, I want to re clean, cleanly repeal Obamacare and then implement a few modest free market reforms. Some of these guys already talked about it. Uh, cross state line, uh, uh, national marketplace is what I call it. Uh, one of the keys that the Heritage Foundation talked to me about last year was the fact that full tax deductibility for individuals when they purchase policies, that needs to be uh, put in there as well. And then uh, furthermore, uh, portability, the ability to take your policy with you, uh, you know, that, that gets to the whole issue of uh, um, uh, pre-existing conditions and so if we can do a few simple uh, reforms we can do that and so that's that's what I stand for the key is we got to get the federal government out of the healthcare industry and and one one quick thing when they when they mandate what the insurance companies have to, to cover and, and that they can't turn anybody away that take that turns it from insurance into something other than insurance because insurance is driven by actuarial science so we got to get back to the real thing let's talk about taxes real quick it's been uh several decades since there's been any real fundamental tax reform in this country. Uh, I know that's uh, one of President Trump's major agenda items that he's been struggling with with Congress. Uh, where do you stand? I'm assuming you're all Republicans, you're all conservatives. I don't need to ask you if you're in favor of cutting taxes. I believe that would be a yes across the board. I hope so. If not, let us know. Um, <laughs> uh, but what does tax reform look like? If you were the only vote that mattered, I mean, it was all in your hands, what would fundamental tax reform look like in your world? So I'm a small business owner as well. For 27 years, my brothers and I own a, a hockey store called Duluth Hockey Company. Real simple. The workers get to keep more of what they earn because I know that the workers can spend the money and invest it better than the government can. And we and when we allow the, the worker to retain more of the money they earn, they're going to spend it in our local economy. They're going to spend it in our small businesses. And I think that, that that's going to be part of that economic engine that's required that the conservative uh, folks like ourselves uh, want to see. And so as far as taxes go, when we can, uh, when we can put in place the opportunity for somebody, number one, we have to dignify having a job, right? Somebody has a job, they've got to be able to keep more of what they earn, spend it, invest it, and uh, I think that the opportunities will present themselves for the entrepreneurial spirit when they see that they can keep more of what they earn. And so we know that we have to have taxes for certain things in government, right? I mean, government, uh, uh, the infrastructure, our military, uh, those are some things that we, we, when our taxes are invested wisely, uh, everyone benefits but uh, the key thing is invested wisely. Well, for me, uh, tax reform, I, w I was on the Hill um, with Congressman Stanglin the last time they did this uh, during the Reagan Revolution, and you know, it has been a long time. But I, but I think you, know, you talk about you want to drain the swamp, you want to change Washington, how do you do that? Well, the way you have to do that is you have to take the power from the politicians, the bureaucrats, and the interest groups and send it back to the people. 
And the way you do that with tax reform is that you make it so that the people are in charge of how they save, hold, invest, spend their own money, rather than having the government and the, and the, and the crooked politicians and everybody try to coax them to do that. We don't need any of that a, a, anymore. So, and when it comes on the corporate side and the business side, corporate tax has to come down, try to bring the money back home, make us competitive around the world again, allow the farmers and businesses, small businesses, expense their items in the current year. If we did those types of things, the economy would boom. If President Trump and the Republicans can just pull this off, get things going with health care, maybe get one more Supreme Court justice on there, the attitude of this country is going to shift the business attitude and everything else, and I think, again, we will be rewarded because they will be doing the right thing for the people. I'm hugely in favor of dramatic tax uh, reductions in the federal level. We not only need to reduce the rates and reduce the number of brackets, but I would suggest even further. If we could get income tax reductions, that would be great, but I'd actually like to see us eventually go away from taxing income altogether. Um, I'd like to abolish the federal corporate income tax and the federal personal income tax because, frankly, I don't know about you all, but it offends me that your contribution to the federal enterprise has something to do with what you earned in a particular year. I just think it's fundamentally unfair. I don't think it makes any sense. Uh, what I'd like to replace it with uh, is something like the fair tax, a national sales tax of, of some sort. Now, I'm not wedded to the fair tax in particular in the number. I think they had 22% for the fair tax. Yeah, 22, Some, 23. Something yeah. like that. Uh, because I think it would, it would do a lot of things. It would, one, it would broaden the tax base. Right now, we've, we've got a lot of Americans that aren't paying federal income tax. So we have to broaden the tax base. I think most economists uh, understand that and agree with that. But second of all, it would also heal the, uh, the, fe the, uh, the culture of our nation. Right now, we've got a lot of covetous covetousness and greed and people looking at somebody, the guy next door to you, if he's doing better than you, then we've got to sock it to him. And I think that's uh, damaging for the nation. And so if we can do away with uh, taxing income, and go to something more like a consumption tax, I think it would heal the country a lot. So if you remember one thing, uh, when it comes to taxes, government doesn't have, doesn't have um, an income problem, it has a spending problem, okay? And one of the things that bothers me is when we say, well, if we reduce taxes, it'll end up increasing tax revenues and we can do great things with that. No, government does not need your money, okay? I've seen it firsthand. They do not need your money. You need your money. And this, this nation will flourish when the individual person can use the money that they've worked hard for. The hardworking taxpayers can do the things necessary to grow the, bit, to grow the economy, to uh, improve their personal lives. I agree actually with uh, Dave in that I believe, I, I tend to favor consumption tax, taxes. And here's the reason why. They tend to be fair across the different people. One of the problems that we have in the United States right now is only a very small percentage of people are being taxed and being taxed very heavily. The press and other people like to say otherwise, but that's a reality. And I'm not saying the poorest of our people need to, need to put forth a serious, uh, or a, uh, an amount that would hurt them, but I do think that everyone has a stake in our country and everyone should be able to invest to the degree that they can. Consumption ta taxes have a tendency to do that. In general, we are taxed across too many different levels at the federal, state, and local level. A lot of those need to be drawn back a little bit, simpler, flatter, um, and I believe that we will succeed as, a, as, a, as an economy and as a nation if we do that. Yes, yeah, we have the third highest corporate tax rate, and we gotta get that down. And I, I fully, fully support doing the, the consumption tax. Be, living over on the western side, like. Dave, Tim, and I do. It's hard to compete with like South Dakota. They don't have no. They don't have any income tax. So a company is likely to move their base from Minnesota to South Dakota to save on taxes. You guys talking about consumption tax or, or speaking my language? Another aspect of it that doesn't get talked about is how much money uh, is spent by tourists, foreign tourists. How much money is spent uh, via people that get their income through black market activities? All that. All those people become taxpayers uh, when you when you start talking about a consumption tax. So I like where your heads out on that. Uh, we are uh, short on time. We're getting a little close to the end. I do want to open it up to any audience questions. If anybody has a, a question, just come right up here. Yeah, I have a number of questions actually for, for you in particular. Uh, I, but I, well, that's my favorite. It goes like this. You want to? You said you wanted to get the government out of healthcare. You also said that well, we should keep 
uh, the um, pre-existing condition, right? People pre should be able to get their insurance. Okay, now, I own an insurance company. Not really. And it's going to cost me a hell of a lot of money to insure people that come in with pre-existing conditions. That's not, that's not what I said, by the way. But go well, ahead. that's what I heard you say. No, I'm, I'm completely against that. I don't like the idea of the federal government telling you you must insure anybody that applies to your, to your company. Then how are you going to enforce pre-existing conditions? The, if, the, it, it, if you want pre-existing conditions to be insurable, someone's going to have to make me, the insurance company, no. infor, you know, insure them. No. How are you going to do that? No, I'm not going to do that. That's not, And that wasn't what I meant to propose, if that's what you heard. But right. What I mean is, if you, if you sign up with a policy with no pre-existing conditions, and then you subsequently have an existing condition, you'll be able to keep your policy simply because it's portable. That, that was the portability issue. Um, not because I would mandate by law that you have to sign somebody up who has a pre-existing condition. Does that is that a good distinction? Right, right. Does anybody else have a question? That come on up. Um, hello, um, I have a question about. The base, what we, what we would call modern day, like sort of alt left and alt right as it is, um, and sort of the, as the alt right rises in America, due to whatever might have caused by Donald Trump's election or, the sort of hate that right wingers may have gotten or just in general, you know, kids my age who might enjoy a joke or something then end up, getting called multiple phobias and all these names basically by the alt left, or just leftists as many are called and that to distinguish between a leftist and a liberal you know liberal right-minded in the head you know not going to scream at you versus a leftist who is quite the opposite and holds it back um what would what is your say basically when it comes to the increasing violence on the left and in general just liberal but also on the leftist side that even in my brother used to go to a liberal arts school he was repeatedly threatened with physical violence and even death by all these students who are the kind that say we accept everyone, we love everyone sort of thing. And, you know, what's your opinion on that? That's a great question. And let me tell you something. Uh, in the police profession, the last 23 years, we saw the progression of violence on the street towards law enforcement officers, both state, federal, and local, increase. And I think that there's, we, we lost the respect to have that healthy dialogue and uh, as far as uh, bigotry and hatred, uh, neo-Nazi views, white supremacist views should never, ever be tolerated. And I fought against that. And it never, ever. And so I want, I want to make sure that we work on that dialogue, that healthy dialogue. Because when we have a healthy dialogue, the outcome is going to be better. And violence should never, ever be tolerated. Ever. Yeah, I, I think you push back. I mean... If somebody's out there committing violence and it's in the name or you know, some sort of vile extremism in the name of politics, in the name of race, in the name of religion, you know, we, we push back on that with all morality that we have in our society. We, we do stand up for the rule of law and law and order. And uh, e pluribus unum, you know, out of many, one. We should, we should stand together as, as one people. But what I don't like what's going on out there is the way the left of this country takes any episode and tries to make uh, law-abiding good people into, into extremists, and that's, that's not right either. So uh, yeah, political correctness, as far as I'm concerned, that era is dead. We need to move beyond it, and uh, we need to just uh, get along as, as, as fine Americans. So we live in very difficult times because we have extreme ideologies that are pushing agendas that are very public, very vocal, and they're trying to force us, very rational, very normal people, to make a decision and, and to choose your sides and stuff like that. And that's a problem. I certainly do not condone any extreme ideology. I certainly don't con condone at all what the white supremacists did, anything more than I do um, Antifa. The problem that I've seen over the eight years of the Obama administration is that we have started to condone lawlessness. Many of the things that we can take care of, you can talk about immigration, you can talk about gun control, you can talk about a lot of these issues. We have things that are already on the books that can protect the police officers, that can do, that follow due process. So when someone commits a crime, they are prosecuted and they spend time. 
But I can tell you this, last year we just tried to do one simple thing, and that's if you block I-94, which by the way is already against the law, but it was a misdemeanor, so people, were, they didn't want to prosecute, too much work for too little return. We just wanted to make it a gross misdemeanor. That's all we wanted to do. If you put people in danger, you are going to pay the penalties. And that got fought against. And I was told that I was the radical because I you know, didn't want to listen to these people. So if we can get back to obeying the law, that is something that I really hope in the next eight years we can do as a society. Okay? Law is not meant to be oppressive. Law is meant to keep us in the lanes and to give people that obey the law the rights and, and the responsibilities that they're allowed to have. So certainly we cannot condone when someone like you is being put under threat, being labeled, being attacked. We need to learn how to understand each other better and improve on the dialogue. Yeah, the beauty of this country is the left and the right, they can disagree, but what what's not good is when they when they have violence, that's, that's against the law. So you asked what, what we think about all this. Uh, I condemn the violence on both sides. And um, I, I, think, uh, I think those, those uh, highlighted examples recently are, are much more marginal than a lot of people, a lot of what the media is making it to be. So I think our nation's in better shape than what the media is portraying. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, and I think a, a big part of it, if I may, is just, just rejecting the premise. Uh, you know, there are elements of this country, if you even are remotely, moderately conservative, are gonna call you all sorts of names. They're gonna, they're gonna call you every ist that they could come up with. And, and part of the strategy is just not engaging on that level, completely rejecting the premise. Let me give this guy a chance to ask a question here. Hi, Ryan Tricky. Um, did uh, 14 years in the military, uh, did three tours over there. Seen a lot going on over there. I know that our country spends a lot of money over there for uh, certain reasons. I'm very patriotic. However, what is your stance on foreign policy and what has it really benefited us uh, intervening in all these countries and having 186 bases in uh, all over the world. So what is your stance on foreign policy? And uh, if we do have to face threats, what are you? what is your stance on that? First of all, I want to thank you for your service. And that's not just a cl cliche. Sir, thank you for your service. So uh, we are, we, I think that uh, America and our way of life are under attack. And uh, what I think we ought to do is, is really stand up for our values. And when you talk about bases, 186 bases and what have you, when my wife was over in Iraq, uh, she met an Iraqi girl. Uh, they forged a relationship. When my wife came, uh, left uh, Sather Air Base, and, and they both shed tears because they weren't sure they were going to uh, be talking to each other ever again. That's the human spirit. We all want peace. We all want to be fed. We all want to uh, be healthy. And so what I think we've lost uh, from the 10,000 foot level is that human connection between us. Now we're going to have rogue uh, uh, dictators like in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, uh, who has threatened the United States. We want nothing more than peace. But I want to make sure that our military, the young men and women, the vol all volunteer service is ready to, de to defend our nation. And I want to be able to let our generals and the, 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 the military experts help us dictate how we can resolve a situation peacefully first and then the last resort the last resort is uh, force to answer your question uh, I think history informs us that the uh, decision to invade Iraq in 2003 was a was a mistake um, once we committed and, and went in there and paid a certain price then I think we should have stayed I think uh, President Obama pulling out in 2011 was a huge mistake uh, and I didn't buy at all his explanation that that uh, SOFA had run out and, and we had to pull out. He had a year and a half to renegotiate the SOFA agreement and could have done that, and I think he should have. But ultimately, I, I think it was a mistake to go in. In Afghanistan, uh, clearly in November of 2001, when we went in to, to hit the Taliban, that was exactly the right choice. But I think by the spring of 02, we should have been out of there, except for maybe a small contingent of special operators to stay back and inform the, the, the national government. I think all this time that we've been there has been a waste of resources and lives. And I think that, uh, I believe President Trump when he says that uh, his new effort here is to, is to really do war and not do nation building. I believe him on that and I hope, I hope he can stick to that. But I think maybe some of his advisors um, um, don't have the right uh, perspective on that. And so we need to be wary. And I'm with uh, Congressman uh, Thomas Massey of Kentucky when he's, when he's uh, a little bit um, concerned about, uh, about this new uh, emphasis. But I believe President Trump and I back his current effort. We just gotta, we gotta make sure that it has the right result. 
the re this is one of the key responsibilities of our federal government to protect its peoples and its interests. And the military certainly does an excellent job. And I thank you for the work that you've done. I think you have many people that are service members up here that we've done our work. And, and we have the same heart that you do. I really liked Reagan's approach to where deterrence, a strong military, deterred other nations and other enemies to do things against us. Now, the challenge that we have is, is that when you deter, sometimes they step over the line and we have to act. I do have a problem that I think that we have had a, a policy over the years of spreading democracy with a theory that democracy will um, enable these countries to become independent. You have to earn democracy. I think that's the one lesson we learned. These people, and I'm sure that you saw it firsthand, that for people to want the things that we want in, in our constitution and our way of life, they have to earn that. And so do I think that we've overextended ourselves at times? Yes, we absolutely have. But we do need to stick with our strategic partners. I'm very concerned about Korea, the Korean Peninsula right now. I'm concerned about Israel. Um, I'm concerned about the threat of China. I'm concerned about the threat of Russia. So we need to know how we build strong relationships with people like NATO, uh, the Israelis, and things like uh, places like that so that we can, we can maintain and protect the self-interest of the people of our nation. As the world power, we have this responsibility burden. Maybe not responsibility, but we have this burden. And what's happened over the um, Obama years is, is we backed off, we weakened, we gave the apologies, right? We did not properly equip and fund people like you, and that enabled and opened the door for a lot of these uh, uh, enemies of ours to, uh, to attack our own personal interests. So we have a little bit of cleaning up to do, unfortunately, but I do think that in general we need to worry about our priorities first uh, over other nations. Yes, thank you for your service. I, I, I believe the military should be out there to protect the people who can't protect themselves. Like, for example, or, or we got base, we got ships all around Japan. If we pulled out of Japan, China would come in and swoop in and take over Japan. Thank you. Yes, I'm a peace through strength guy, and you know, let's, let's face it, President uh, Trump was handed a very bad hand when it came to the relations around the world uh, during that last administration. Look at the uh, pro-American or neutral actors that the Obama administration undermined in Egypt, in Yemen in Iraq and you go right down the list Libya it's a big big deal and it's caused uh, chaos throughout the region the place is on fire as far as Afghanistan is concerned the president's just taking office he and his team are putting together their policy I think we have to give them some deference on that and follow it pretty closely but I liked two things that he said no more nation building and we're gonna change these rules of engagement so people like you can go overseas get in do the job and be protected as best as possible Sticking on that topic for, for a moment, uh, a lot of people have, have criticized Congress for sort of relinquishing their oversight of the executive branch when it comes to military action. Can you talk just briefly about your perspective on the role Congress should play in that level of oversight uh, when it comes to, uh, to military action from the president? And, and do you intend, what do you intend to do if you, uh, if you are serving? Well, one of the things I will do is look to the experts, the, the, the leaders in our military to give us an idea of what's happening on the ground, what we think are, uh, may happen uh, from the people that hate this country, and listen to them. And then ultimately, uh, the President and the Congress are going to make the decision to, to support that and uh, defend our way of life. I, I think that when you, uh, when you have the experts, the intelligence, you could make real good decisions in defending this country and really our way of life. And so uh, I, I will be all ears listening to the experts, uh, but I will make sure that there's an end game to it. Uh, we talk about, the, Jim just talked about nation building. No, we want to uh, stop the threat to us and, uh, and then uh, and, you know, bring our men and women back uh, once that threat's over. I just say there's a couple other areas where you can defend the country and it doesn't have to do necessarily with military might or even foreign relations. It has to do with our immigration policies. We need to have secure borders and make sure that the people that are coming into our nation, we have merit-based immigration where it makes sense for us. And uh, before President Trump even waded into the issue of uh, refugees and things of that nature, I, I called for a timeout on refugee transfers to the United States, particularly from countries that hate America. Because let's face it, we learned we've learned lessons in Minnesota. We have an assimilation problem in Minnesota. We have a terrorism problem in Minnesota, 
and we need to take a time out and figure out and get it right because we do not want to follow uh, the misery that we've seen in Europe and the mistakes that they've made. You, you asked about congressional oversight. I, I think that's a huge issue because I think, uh, I think it's true that Congress has for the last hundred years been uh, delegating way too much authority to the judiciary as well as the executive. And so I'm very big on Congress taking back their authority, their constitutional duty. Uh, I know Senator Lee from Utah and a couple of guys in the House are working on that, and so I, I strongly support that uh, initiative. Um, one example, one recent example, uh, where I think Congress didn't do their job at all, was President Obama conducted a one-year air war in Libya. He never even sought the approval of Congress, much less got it, and yet Congress just kind of allowed him to do it. Uh, if I'm serving in Congress, uh, I'll do my part to not allow that. I, I, think, I think the President, if he wants to do something like that, pursuant to the to the uh, War Powers Act has to get approval of Congress. And unfortunately, in the case of President Obama, he didn't even seek it. Uh, one more audience question here, go ahead. All right, gentlemen, you'll have to forgive me. I haven't been in Minnesota long, so I'm not familiar with all of you. And this question is mainly just for our uh, incumbents. Did We've heard some good things up here, but did any of you vote against Paul Ryan continuing his speakership? None of, us are incumbents. None of them are incumbents. Vote against Paul Ryan. Do you plan to vote against Paul Ryan continuing his speakership? Yeah, like how Dave gave me the gave me the microphone first. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be very direct with my answer if you allow me to kind of fill in behind that. Okay, I do not plan at this time to support Paul Ryan. I think he's going in the wrong direction. However, sorry about that. I'm having a microphone problem tonight. I, I'll say it again. So that you didn't think that was on purpose. I do, not, I do not support the direction that Paul Ryan is taking Congress at this time, okay? However, we are in a process now to we're talking about 2019 before we're actually taking a seat, and it's sort of a, it's a, it's a good question to understand where we stand on the direction of Congress going right now, but a lot is going to change over that time. So I have nothing against him personally, I just believe that Congress is going in the wrong direction. I mentioned the word courage earlier. I don't think they're showing the courage. I think spe special interests have quickly invaded the Republican side. We complained about them when it was a Democrat special interest. And we're going to have to have leadership that ensures that we do the will of the people. Whoever that person is, I will certainly support that. And if Paul Ryan goes in that direction in the next two years, I'll support him as well. I'm skeptical, but I will. Matt, Paul Ryan for speaker, would you support him? Yes, I would. Okay. Dave? Like, like Tim said, it's two years. It's quite a while until January of 19. And, and of course, part of answering your question is knowing uh, who would be competing with him for the speakership. Um, I'm not impressed with what he's doing right now. So my, my short answer is that I would prefer someone else. And I'm Dave Hughes running for Congress in D District 7. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> When I'm in Congress, uh, uh, I'll let you know because people can change their views, change their ways, and uh, he may not be uh, running for the speaker in two years. There might be uh, someone else. So to answer your question, uh, when I'm there, uh, I'll let you know. But uh, you know, it's 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 too far in advance right now because people have the ability to change, and uh, I, I hope he does. Yeah, I like what Tom Emmer says. He says, you know, if you're going to circle the wagons in the Republican Party, make sure that when you fire, you fire out, not in. And, and I think uh, what happens is in the next Congress, we hopefully hold our majority. There will be an election about a week or two after that election, and we'll see who runs for speaker. Until then, it's very, you have to be very cautious about what you do. A lot can happen in this next year and a half. And all of us in these uh, swing districts and these open well, I have an open seat, but they're working against vulnerable incumbents. We need help. We need help from everybody. We need help from the Washington uh, Republicans. We need help from the state Republicans. We need help from the district Republicans. We need help from you, sir. And I hope you'll write me a check. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough question to answer. <laughs> tough question to answer when you don't know who's going to be running or, you know, I mean, Paul Ryan may be the best choice available of everybody that throws their hat in the ring. We are uh, out of time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you guys. Great job up here. Really appreciate it. Thank you to uh, Jennifer Carnahan for uh, setting this up, and I appreciate the opportunity. Again, my name is Drew. You can hear me 6 to 9, Monday through Friday on Twin Cities News Talk AM 1130, co-host of the Justice and Drew Show. Thank you very much.